Hey guys, we're at Digital Stratosphere 2023 today. Waka's gonna be starting his keynote address in a couple of hours. Where he'll be going over the current state of industry, the future of industry, and what advances we've made using industry 4.0 technologies. Let's get right into it. Okay, everyone. So I am very excited and honestly a bit nervous to <laughs> introduce Walker Reynolds, who is a known thought leader in our space, an innovator, entrepreneur. Um, he and Eric and Emma are kindred spirits. So um, it's a great opportunity to ask questions about specific things because he does have such a vast background. Um, and we are definitely grateful for his time and insight in being here. So with that, the stage is yours, Walker. Thank you so much. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. All right, so we're good? All right, excellent. Um, all right, real quick. So I don't give keynotes the way most people talk, so it's very interactive. I'm gonna ask you a lot of questions. If, you, if I think you're not paying attention, uh, I'm, de I'm definitely gonna like, come out and talk to you. So you should, I'm gonna, uh, and I will put you on blast. So if you're like writing emails or whatever, you might wanna go to a different session because I will definitely come and talk to you, for sure, okay? Uh, how many people here have seen our like YouTube channel or IOT.University? So maybe a third, all right. So I like to do something at the beginning of all my presentations. I ask myself a question, I ask myself four questions before I ever present. Uh, number one, why should anyone listen to me, okay? Uh, number two, what am I gonna say? Number three, what are you gonna hear? Number four, what will you say is most valuable? Right? If I can't answer those four questions, I don't accept the speaking invite. Okay, so number one, why should you listen to me? Um, I suppose that's in the eye of the beholder, but um, I am a solutions architect. I'm a sociologist. I am a electrical engineer, and I have a master's degree in education. I actually was gonna teach as well myself, and then when I did my student teaching, I realized I would kill seventh graders in a closet somewhere, so <laughs> I became an engineer, okay? Um, I grew up in upstate New York um, in the 1980s, a really poor kid. I got adopted in upstate New York. I grew up in a trailer park in a working class community at a time when uh, a lot of really good manufacturing jobs were still in the Northeast. But I happened to be there during high school when all the manufacturing jobs left, like over a 12 year period. Um, IBM went to Research Triangle Park in North Carolina. Magna left for Mexico. Uh, Kodak made the decision with the digital camera. Um, and what I saw were all my friends' parents go from like middle class and upper middle class to like working in gas stations, literally. Um, people, all, everyone had lost their homes. Over the last, say, 35 or 40 years, upstate New York has turned into a punchline. It's a dump. It's, I still own a home there, but I would never encourage anyone to move there or live there or work there. Uh, and, the, and the question is why, right? It was once vibrant, and now it is not. And there are places in the United States that are vibrant. And the question is why? And the answer is because they have manufacturing. Okay, they have industry. Uh, you show me a great place in America to live, and I will show you a place that makes money off of industry and manufacturing. Okay. So I actually thought that the reason we lost all these great paying jobs in upstate New York was corporate greed. I thought it was a combination of the unions asking for too much and you know, blood sucking vampires in the board of directors who didn't care about their people, right? Uh, I was wrong. I think most people thought that that was the case actually. Um, I took a bunch of employment classes and I learned what actually happened in the Northeast. Um, so, is everybody familiar with the Industrial Revolutions? So first Industrial Revolution, steam engine, second Industrial Revolution, the assembly line, third, took place in 1969, it was the PLC. Does everybody, who here knows what a PLC is when I say programmable logic controller? Okay, great, most people. That, ha that came in 1969. Uh, who were the first nations to adopt 
industry three technology. There's only two of them. Well, that's a problem. It was Japan and Germany. And the United States didn't start adopting that technology en masse until the mid-80s when it was too late. So we didn't leverage technology to do more with less. Does everybody agree that a programmable logic controller is a much more efficient use of technology than a huge panel on a wall with ice cube relays controlling your processes? Everybody agrees with that, I hope. So what American companies had to do was go someplace where the labor was really cheap to catch up. That's what actually happened, okay? So when I was at North Carolina State, I learned, oh wow, Technology is the reason all those jobs went away, our, our lack of adopting that technology. I also learned that the Industrial Revolutions are a natural evolution of civilization. They will always happen. If we vaporize the Earth, every single one of us is dead, and the only thing that's left are bacteria and cockroaches. Human beings will evolve again. They will civilize and the industrial revolutions will happen all over again. And that's an empirical certainty. So what that meant was there would be a fourth industrial revolution. So in the 90s, I learned, oh, there's gonna be another technological revolution. We scroll down to, uh, this, is, this is how companies evolve, right? This is the technology S curve. First industrial revolution, we had very low return in the first industrial revolution, then exponential return on value and then it plateaued, and then we had groundbreaking innovation where the lighthouse is, and then the second industrial revolution started, and then the same thing happened with the third, and then the same thing happened with the fourth. Right now, all of you, no matter what industry you're in, you're either in this technology S-curve here for industry three, or you're in industry four, okay? You're in one of those two places. Do you know that the vast majority of manufacturers and those in industry, 11 out of 12 in fact, will not jump past the lighthouse? Only one in 12 will make the leap. Does that surprise, that number surprise anybody? Okay, one in 12. How many of you are with companies that are older than 25 years? Okay, one in 12 of you are going to make it. One in 12. How many of you are decision makers? Okay, a lot of you. How many of you are in manufacturing? How many of you are not in manufacturing but you're like in IT or services? Okay, so, and is there any other industry I didn't hit? Healthcare. So we've got healthcare, we've got IT services, we've got manufacturing here, okay? Uh, education. education. So I spoke in Tulsa a couple days ago and it was all healthcare and higher ed and there was nobody in that room who was gonna make it. Nobody, okay? So let's go back up to my, our agenda. All right, so what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna do what I always do, I'm gonna wing it, okay? But I'm gonna start with, uh, what's this? It's a smartphone, it's an iPhone. Does anybody know when this was invented? In 2007, it was announced in September of 2007, and it was released en masse in the beginning of 2008. How many of you are not using a smartphone? If you use a flip phone or a bag phone, or how many of you are not using a smartphone? You could still buy flip phones, so that won't be the reason you're using a smartphone. How many of you are using a smartphone? All of you. Why? Okay, what if you didn't use a smartphone? Could you compete? Yeah, let's say you're the, one, you're the one director on the board who doesn't use a smartphone. You'd look pretty stupid pretty quickly. You'd look ignorant quickly. You'd look stupid quickly. You'd also be incredibly inefficient. This is what we refer to as a single pane of glass into all of human knowledge. That's what this is in our daily lives. It's a single pane of glass. You know what digital transformation is? It's building this for a manufacturer or industry or for the financial industry. Building a single pane of glass. 
a single source of truth for all data and information for all consumers, non-deterministically. I can tell you what my net worth is, where all of my kids are. I can tell you my schedule for the next two months. I can research anything I want to research. I was telling my, my 16-year-old son, Hayden, the other day. He said to me, Dad, what did you do before the internet? And I said, I waited to go to the public library on Sunday. I wrote down all the questions that came up during the week that my dad couldn't answer. And on Sunday, we went to the public library. And I would go research all the answers. I can, tell, I can still recite the Dewey Decimal System. But how inefficient was that? Incredibly inefficient. Now you can answer questions in 10 seconds. Any question. I dare you to try. I dare you to come up with a question you can't answer. And, we, and I'm not even talking about with ChatGPT. Let's, we'll leave that out for just a second. How many of your organizations have a single pane of glass for all data and information? A single source of truth for all data and information for your organization. And if you raise your hand, I assure you, I'm going to call on you. <laughs> Does that scare anybody? It should. Because until you get to this, you're not the one in 12. Right? So let's start with Tesla. Why is Tesla awesome? First off, does everybody agree that Tesla is awesome? Does anybody think Tesla is not awesome? Why? You don't like their cars? Do you, have you driven one? What, why don't you like the Tesla? What's the reason? It's minimalist, right? Right. Does everyone agree that, uh, who here owns a Ford? Uh, BMW, Mercedes, Chevy, GM, okay. Audi, okay. So Audi is actually not a bad choice, okay. Um, I assure you Tesla's awesome. Here's why they're awesome. Tesla doesn't build cars. They're not a car company. They're a data company. Like in January of this year, the first quarter of this year, the Model Y became the best-selling car in the world. How many analysts predicted that the Model Y would be the number one selling car in the world in the first quarter of 2023? Of 13,650, give or take, auto analysts, how many selected the Model Y as the number one selling car in the world in Q1 of 2023? Zero. Zero. And then in the second quarter, they pulled away. How many analysts of the 13,550, give or take, thought that they would pull away in the second quarter? Zero. Do you know when's the last time a non-Toyota car was the best-selling car in the world after the, before the first quarter of this year? More than two decades ago. And it was the Lumina before that, and then it was the Accord before that, and it was the Camry before that. I assure you, Tesla's awesome. Here's why they're awesome. I drive a Model S. I bought a Model S almost two years ago. Um, it has received 52 software updates since I bought it. It has 111 brand new features. Features that didn't exist when I bought it. And I've never taken my Tesla anywhere but my house. It drives me to work. It drives me home. It drove me to Tulsa. I'm more efficient. I don't get to waste time. And the car just gets better. There has been four recalls, recalls, that were fixed with software updates. They didn't go to a shop. It just happened in my garage. The Tesla that I drive today is not the same car I drove off the lot. But if you drive a General Motors or you drive a Ford, it is literally the exact same car you drove off the lot whenever you drove it off the lot. That's why Tesla's awesome. How do they do that? They're a data company. Jim Farley, who's the CEO of Ford, he just went on a podcast in August. Did everybody see this? Anybody see Ford's? If you saw Jim Farley wave the right flag, you saw it? Okay. So I think it's called Gears and Something is the name of the podcast. And Farley admitted we lost. He said we cannot beat Tesla. We have to join them. That's what he said. Why did he say that? 
Well, the answer is, he said, we're not a software company. We're not a data company. Over the last 25 years, we outsourced all of our intellectual property. Bosch owns the technology inside of our electronic control module. We don't. They own the data inside of the electronic control module. We don't. So how can we use the data inside that ECM to make our processes better? The answer is we can't. We have to wait eight years for the contract to expire. We'll be dead in eight years. So there's a lot of ERP people here, right? I am super hard on ERP people. So this is a, a video I shot on YouTube a few years ago, so, uh, maybe four years ago, something like that. And someone had asked me the question, um, Walker, what about ERP? Okay. And at the time, I, I did this rant. I, I encourage you to watch this. What I said was, the problem with ERP is not the functions it provides a business. It's that it's being sold wrong. It's being sold as a platform for solving problems for the business. It's being sold as infrastructure. It's being sold as a single source of truth. It is not. It is a master data model with a bunch of functions wrapped around it. I was just having a conversation with the Epicor lady, right? So I use, um, and, I'm, and I'm, I mean that respectfully, but I don't remember her name. Um, I don't remember anybody's name. Uh, a really common implementation in manufacturing is Epicor ERP and Infor CMMS. Okay, so maintenance management system being managed by Infor and ERP being managed by Epicor. And let's say I wanted to do something simple like Tesla does. I want to use all the digital data in my business to find patterns in that data that we can't see with the naked eye. I want to use artificial intelligence and machine learning. Let's do uh, the ML and AI definitions. Machine learning is just using computers to learn from data and artificial intelligence is using computers to mimic human intelligence. That's all it is. Okay, it, uh, Emma was right, artificial intelligence is just a big blanket term. ML is a subset of AI. Machine learning is learning from data, and AI is mimicking human intelligence with computers. Okay, you know what Tesla does? Tesla collects every single data point in the business and puts it in one place. They use, it, it, who, which ERP system does Tesla use? This is a good question. What's that? Right, they wrote their own. The most valuable company in the world, the fastest growing company in the world, the one that produces the absolute best vehicle on the planet and the top selling vehicle on the planet doesn't use any of your ERP systems. That doesn't bother anybody? That doesn't make anybody ask why. It should. I'll tell you why. Let's go back to my Infor and Epicor example. Let's say I wanted to do something very simple. Does everybody know what MTTR and MTBF is? Mean time to repair, mean time between failure? Okay, so in maintenance, mean time to repair and mean, mean time between failure are two very important KPIs. Mean time to repair is how long does it take us to get an asset back up and running once it's gone down, the average time. Mean time between failure is what is the average time between failures? So what we want is the mean time to repair to get really low and the mean time between failure to get really long. Infor calculates this number. They're very important numbers. Infor CMMS calculates this number. But if what I wanted to do was use a machine learning algorithm to compare those two KPIs from Infor with data points that live inside of the Epicor ERP, how much would it cost me just to put the data together? One asset in engineering, hint, it is a six-figure number. Six figures in just engineering. And that's just one tiny use case. What Tesla does is they say, screw that. We don't allow the monoliths to hold the data. We own the data. So the data is going to be put in one place, and it's going to be semantically organized. I'm going to talk about unified namespace and kind of where we're going. These are terms you must know. Okay, You must know what a unified namespace is. Okay. Because all of the most advanced companies in the world are leveraging UNS. We have a data set of 1,383 manufacturers gauged across digital maturity. One of our clients who's visiting here, they've been scored uh, across that data set. What we do is we do digital maturity and we do a normalized distribution okay, of 1,380 something companies. The, anybody who is on the mean in terms of digital maturity measured across 10 pillars, on the mean or below, they're dead. 
after November of 2022, when ChatGPT came out, anybody who was on the mean or below the mean in digital maturity cannot catch up. Just like Jim Farley said, we cannot catch Tesla. Why? Because Tesla solves problems in two weeks, and it takes Ford 16 to 24 weeks to solve the same problem. Why? Because they don't have access to the data. If they know about the problem, correct. One of the values of machine learning, what most people do with data, say, who here's a data analyst or works in that sphere? Okay, all right, so you're a data analyst. And what, I'm, what do you currently do with data? Someone comes to you with a problem, a, hypo, a hypothesis you need to test. And then you say, here's what I'm gonna try and solve. I go and I acquire the data, I connect, collect, and store that data. And then I try to build a solution to learn from that data. Okay, that's, that's the way that cavemen do it. At Tesla, they use machine learning to come up with the hypothesis that you should be testing. This is the pattern we see. It doesn't matter that someone's noticed it. It just matters it exists. Let's, ask, let's go to Amazon real quick. Why is Amazon awesome? The, first off, does everybody agree Amazon's awesome? Who here has an advanced degree? That is a graduate degree. Raise your hand. All right, so we're looking at 40% have graduate degrees. I'm assuming very smart people. Okay, we have a room full of very smart people. We probably have 1,000 years of experience in industry. And we're going to do a little thought experiment. Okay, I'm the CEO. You guys are my team. Here's what we're going to do. We are going to build a company where any person in the United States, 99% of the population, can buy whatever they want for the absolute best price, get it delivered to their door in 48 hours or less, 98% of the time. How do we do it? I mean, I, I normally I'd have a whiteboard and I'd listen to the ideas, you'd have none, so it would just be an empty whiteboard. <laughs> okay. How does Amazon do it? Does anybody know? I mean, if you're in, if you're in mentorship or mastermind, our educational programs don't answer it. If you, if you, but if you're not in the programs, I want, I want somebody who hasn't been told how they do it to tell me how they do it. Who here uses Amazon? It better, everybody better raise their hand. Okay. They predict what you're going to buy six weeks before you buy it. They predict what you're gonna buy six weeks before you buy it. Why is that six week number important? That's their lead time, right? That they gotta predict it six weeks in advance. We have a great video in, our, in Mastermind actually where their architect came on and explained how they did it. Amazon predicts what you're gonna buy six weeks before you buy it so that they can make sure that it's in the distribution center that's within 48 hours of you. How do they do that? I mean, it's, what's crazy is I, I have been speaking nonstop for six weeks. This is not normal. Normally, I speak six times a year. I've been speaking nonstop for the last six weeks. And the reason why is because a, a couple of the slides I'm going to show, show you at the end. Like, the world has fundamentally changed. All the major players in the world have realized unified namespace is the only way that organizations can survive. And because my name is attached to unified namespace, because I designed the architecture in 2005, everybody wants me to come and speak. So for the last six weeks, I've been speaking nonstop. I was in Tulsa two days ago. I was in Portland, Maine. I was in Boston. I was in Florida. I forget where I am sometimes. Do you know that I've asked this section in every single speech? Not a single person can tell me how Amazon does it. No one. But I can call somebody at Amazon and ask them how they do it and they can tell me. I can call somebody, I'm gonna ask you guys a question here in a second. I can call someone at Tesla, anybody, any employee, and I can say, what is your digital strategy? What is Tesla's digital strategy? And they can recite it from memory. Just like at my organization, we don't allow PowerPoint, which is why we're on OneNote. It is actually a zero tolerance policy, which is why I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. I own the company, I gotta represent, right? I could call Tesla and say, what is your digital strategy? How many of you have a digital strategy statement in your organization who's not a member of Mastermind or Mentorship? Three sentences, go. I wrote it down. Okay. I was afraid you would ask. You'll be the first person. I, I, I watched your presentation in Boston. Okay, awesome. Thank you. It's, it's not going to be good, but it's my shot at it. 
Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Uh, Ready Foods will either go out of business or be sold if we do not make a successful digital transformation. We must collect, harvest, and use all the digital information the business is currently generating. Effectively using our data will make our past, current, and future story understandable. Perfect. That is an excellent digital strategy statement. Did everybody hear that? Okay. None of you have that. One of the things that Emma talked about with the, the three pillars, communication, um, intelligence, I don't remember what the, what is it? Okay. We call that digital strategy. All digital, digital transformation initiatives start with a digital strategy statement. The why we want to be digital. Why we want to make data our primary commodity. I'm going to show you a video here real quick. Go to the full strength. This is totally unrelated to manufacturing. It's five minutes, okay? But I want to talk about what we achieved here just using data, okay? Go ahead. So this is a documentary we came out with a couple weeks ago about a technology we developed in one of my other companies called fullstrength.ai. Okay. Same technology. Where is industry four going? It's going everywhere. It's not limited to one sector. And how is it getting there? Unified namespace. What is the difference between the elite level athlete and the weekend warrior? So I'm Walker Reynolds. I'm the president and founder of fullstrength.ai. I grew up in upstate New York. I was a poor kid, dirt ass poor kid. You know, we had to save up to be poor. But I, I grew up in a family that taught three very, very valuable pillars for life. Number one, discipline. Number two, respect. Number three, hard work. And the family that I grew up in talked a lot about until you have those three pillars on lockdown, don't focus on anything else. And so the foundation upon my life, upon which I do everything in my life is based on those, those three pillars. And then later on, I translated those three pillars into the five core values upon which I operate all my companies, um, transparency, authenticity, expertise, humility, and servant leadership. And then our life's mission, my literally the goal for my life is to help save and create middle-class jobs in the US. That's my goal. And it's because I grew up in a place and a time when middle-class jobs evaporated in the Northeast. And that was just a function of us not leveraging technology. So I've dedicated my life to using technology to help save and create middle-class jobs. I'm a 49-year-old engineer and entrepreneur who specializes in digital transformation. I built my career, my, my engineering reputation on helping manufacturers digitally transform so that we can remain viable in a global economy. That is, manufacturing in the United States can remain viable. I've built my entire reputation on helping manufacturers remain viable by becoming digital. What's happened is, I'm also a strength athlete. And over the last two years, I've been converging together that which I've, I do in my professional life with what I do in my oh, personal Oh, there's Josh life. right there. You know, powerlifting with my my team. Nice beard. The interesting thing that's happening right now is we're transitioning from the fourth to the fifth industrial revolution. Fifth industrial revolution is all about artificial intelligence, the convergence of artificial intelligence with human intelligence. And that's sort of where our vision system comes from. It's very much a Brian Shaw. fifth industrial revolution product. And that's our technology right there. One of the things that just stands out to me over the last three years of being very, very serious lifter is the sheer number of people who come and go. You know, there's what, 40 core lifters at our gym. There are thousands that come through. Pause. I mean, that's not hyperbole. There are literally. So this is a metaphor for gen uh, millennials, okay? Uh, if you're in manufacturing, you know that the biggest problem you have is not data, it's not technology, it's the recruitment and retention of the employee of the future. Okay, why is it you have trouble recruiting and retaining the employee of the future? It's the same reason we have trouble keeping people in the gym. Okay, they don't know what they're doing. They don't have access to, to how to fix it. And 
they feel like they're in the Stone Age. Okay. Um, when I was coming, I'm Gen X. When I was coming up, my first job was working in mining, in a salt mine, shoveling belts. Uh, at the time that I started my first job out of college, we Gen Xers had a um, we had an eight, uh, eleven percent turnover rate at twelve months. So if I started a job out of college, there was a nine out of ten chance I was going to keep that job for twelve months. Do you know what that number is for? Is there any HR people here? They know they're going to know the number. But does anybody know what that number is for millennials today? It's under 50% at the six-month mark in manufacturing. Why? Is it because they're lazy? How many here think millennials are lazy, entitled, and they lack common sense? These are the three I hear all the time. I hear those three all the time. Uh, so my son, Jared, right here, the middle guy with the camera, he works for one of my companies. I assure you millennials are not lazy, entitled. They might lack in common sense but they are not lazy and entitled. They are far smarter than we were coming out of college. Far smarter. My 16-year-old son, Hayden, I have an IQ of 151. I am a smart guy, okay? And I have to study to have conversations with my 16-year-old son. And I'm on the bleeding edge of technology. They are not lazy and entitled. They are smart, and they think you are stupid. They, in fact, they know things, they know what it is you don't know, okay? So the reason they don't stay is because they know you're dying. But guess who doesn't have a problem recruiting and retaining millennials? Tesla doesn't have a problem recruiting and retaining millennials. Amazon doesn't have trouble recruiting and retaining millennials. What's that? She already told you. They are accustomed to being enabled to solve their own problems. When I was 18 years old, I remember after I moved out, but that's another thing. We moved out. All my kids live with me. 24, 24, 19, and 16, they all live with me. We just live in a big, huge house together. And we all work together. When I moved out, I used to call my dad three or four times a week. Dad, how do I, the sink is doing this. Dad, the, the dryer is doing that. Which hammer do I use again if I'm going to repair this? I'm bang a dent out of my car. Which one am I supposed to use again? You know how many times my, kid ask, my kids ask me for help? Never. Never. And if you have kids my age, they don't ask you for help either. Why? They got the answer themselves. So when they go and they work in a manufacturing facility and they're told they can't have their phone on the plant floor and the internet is locked down and some person who has half the IQ of them in the IT department is the one who's telling them no all the time, you know what they say? I'm going to go live with my parents. They don't keep the job. So Jared over here is 19 years old. I have 20, in the three companies we're talking about here, Intellic Integration, 4.0 Solutions, and FullStrength.ai, we have 25 employees. We have 81 degrees. So for 25 employees, there are 81 degrees. I actually had to look this up because I use this anecdote all the time. When ChatGPT came out last November, Jared was nine months out of college. He made $24,000, $25,000. He now makes $52,000. What we did was we did an efficiency um, measurement on our employees, all 25. I mandated that all employees use ChatGPT all day long. A ChatGPT screen right here, and you are a supervisor of AI. And then what we did was we measured output. OK, what is the efficiency gains? I'm an engineer. I can't help it. And we did some tests. So we took a project we did the year before that took 160 man hours. And we were able to re redo that project using ChatGPT in eight. This vision system that we're talking about in this video right here, it took me eight months to write the code start to finish two years ago. I redid it in 40 hours this spring. So when we measured efficiency, okay, we noticed something about ChatGPT adoption in our organization. Who was most likely to adopt ChatGPT? Young people, 30 years and younger, 
who was least likely to do it? My chief experience officer, who is 61, okay? Uh, our um, community liaison, who is in her late 50s, and everybody who was in their 40s. So I had to figure out how to get them to use it. So what we did was we had Jared, over three days, learn three new professions. He was given two hours of time, first to become general counsel. Are you listening over there? Legal counsel. So he had to become legal counsel in two hours. Then he had to become the director of HR the next night. And the third night, he had to become our operations manager. He produced hundreds of pages of documents, complete programs that we spent tens of thousands of dollars on in six hours for salaries that used to be three to $400,000 a year. Who do you think is the most efficient person in my organization out of the 25 employees we have, of which are some are world-class solutions architects? It's Jared. And it's not even close. The next closest person, he's a six to one, a six times output at $52,000 a year at 19. Go to our broker to the right, please. Right here. This is a unified namespace. This is two of my companies. This is all data and information in real time. Okay? While I'm in Denver, speaking on stage, I can look at any data point I care about right now in real time. And every one of my employees has access to this. All of our dashboards are built from this. All of our data analytics is, done, is built from this. This is a small scale unified namespace. Please go to IOT University. So we have 11,000 in IOT.University. We have 11,000 students. Uh, yeah, can you, uh, yeah, just go big. Oh no, don't do that. Um, actually, I don't think he's gonna be able to zoom in. But um, we have 11,000 students. We have 800 paid students. We have 5,000 members in the Industry 4 Discord server. It is very hard for us to manage all of our clients. But I can tell you, just by going to our reports and go by subs by product, I can look at every single person on every single program and payment plan and when their next renewal is from this place. This is the raw data. And all the dashboards that are built are built from this. Uh, if we're using the Epicor and Infor example, what we do is we turn Epicor into a node in an ecosystem and we would have Epicor publish the ERP data into this namespace. This is the technical how. A lot of people talk about what is digital transformation, what is IoT, what is Industry 4. I come to these conferences all the time and there's a lot of people talking saying actually nothing. Okay? This is the technical how. This is how Tesla does it. This is how Amazon does it. Without this, you can't do it. Everything else, Snowflake, Data Lake, ERP, uh, SQL backends, your Power BI front end, all interacts with this interface. I have two companies here that are fully integrated together natively. This is our engineering arm. This is our education and outreach arm. We have three clients. One of them makes ink. One of them makes, is a printer, and one of them makes soda water, and some of you guys are, or sugar water, some of you are drinking them right now. They all have this infrastructure. We went to those three customers and we said, hey, customer who makes pigment, what would you like to know from the printer? If you could have any data from the printer about your ink, what would you want? Oh, that's easy. I wanna know what's the relative humidity inside the plant when they're running the printing presses. I wanna know what the web tension is. I wanna know what the speed is they're running on the press. I wanna know what the oven temperature is. I wanna be able to collect that data so we can improve the chemistry in our pigments. You know how long it took us to give them that? Building something like this? Taking pigment, taking pigment company, printer, and the sugar water guys? 10 minutes. Because they all had that. This is how Tesla does it. This is how Tesla does it with St. Cobain, who makes the windows for a Tesla car. They're all fully integrated together. That's what digital transformation is. But where does it start? It starts with strategy, like what you said. Digital strategy, that comes from the top. 
Then you enable. You create an infrastructure to give people tools to solve problems. Who are the smartest people in any organization? This is an easy one. It's the line worker. They know every single problem in the business. Who is the least knowledgeable person in the organization about what the actual problems are? The CEO. The, CEO. the board of directors. I literally go in and insult the board of directors. That's what I do. <laughs> and that's what they hire me to do. But I go in and I say, you are not the smartest people in the room. You are not. And I don't care what you have to say. What I need you to do is write that. The why. Why do you want to be a digital company? And then I need you to enable people to solve your problems on one common infrastructure. All right? Go back to our slides. Digital transformation is very, very simple for organizations. It's very hard to execute. It happens in two big phases. Okay? Phase number one is becoming a smart company. You connect to all data, you collect all data, you store all data. Then you analyze that data and you visualize that data. Dashboards that I showed you earlier, that's the analyze, visualize phase. Generally, that starts with manufacturing execution, supervisory control and data acquisition. Sometimes it's C-suite level dashboards. But the important part is people in your organization decide what the analyze, visualize is. Then it's find patterns in that data, report the problems, and solve them. That's what Tesla does. Where you are, scroll back up to our technology S-curves. Where you are here, where you are, scroll up. Yeah. Where you are here, industry three, industry four, is a function of how far you are on that list. Do you know what happens after you're a smart company? You plug into a digital supply chain. Does anybody know what a digital supply chain is? What is it? Digital supply chain is I'm no longer plugged into just the links I buy from and the links I sell to. I'm plugged into all links. All potential vendors, all potential customers. One ecosystem, the same way you all are connected together through a smartphone. You have people here who range age groups, expertise, and technical levels. But how many of you would call yourself a technologist? I'm a technologist. Come on, Wade, you're definitely a technologist. All right. So five people, but all of you have smartphones. And I'll bet if you look at your screen time, I'll bet you all of you spend at least six hours looking at that screen every day. Six hours. Yet you can walk into any one of your organizations, any single one, except for maybe yours and maybe Wade's. Well, you're the only two who could potentially have this. And you're, the people who work in your organization don't have the tools to solve your problems. Digital supply chain is our future. It's not a if, it's a when. And here's how I know. Scroll forward. So we're going to skip data ops. And we're going to go unified namespace. Leave it here and let them take photos. If you guys want to take photos of the unified namespace graphics, you can. And by the way, you'll be able, you can go to our YouTube channel. You can go to IoT.University. There's a free IoT mini course on there. It's like 10 videos. It explains much more in depth what I'm trying to do in 45 minutes. But I'm going to go over some stuff that no one's seen before. And um, when you guys publish, uh, you'll be able to, I'm going to put two slides in here that can't be shared. OK, good. Um, go, let's scroll up to the, the next one, Josh. So this is sort of you know, plant A. Plant B, they each have their own unified namespace, and they publish into a higher level UNS, similar to what I showed you there. Enterprise site area line cell, that's ISA 95. Here is a, the results of a survey that came out yesterday. These are the results, I think it was 1,100 respondents. Okay? The question is, how critical is the unified namespace to your digital transformation? These are organizations who are actively digitally transforming. This just came out yesterday. Notice nobody said not relevant. Zero answers. Of the people who are digitally transforming, one in three say it's critical, 20, uh, almost one in three say it's important, and a third are evaluating. That means two thirds are using unified namespace as their infrastructure. Okay? Here's how I know it's here to stay. 
You guys need to learn this term. You need to walk away here with two, two things. Number one, what is our digital strategy? And number two, do not forget unified namespace. Scroll up. Gartner just, everybody, I'm sure there's a bunch of executives here. I'm very hard on Gartner, by the way, but they did a great job in this document, okay? This is a document that Gartner produced in July of this year that abandons, literally trashes the Purdue security model, literally says all architectures built on the Purdue security model will not scale. That's what the document says. You must abandon it. And you must move to this new emerging architecture called unified namespace. Okay, that's what the document says. Scroll down. Whether you are a vendor, whether you're a manufacturer, whether you work in healthcare, you need to ask yourself, go to our agenda, right here. Questions for you. What data do I have? And I'm gonna use Wade's, uh, this is Wade Caldwell gave me, that he mentioned it a second, I said I'm gonna steal that from you, brother. You have lots of smart things in your business that are talking and you ain't listening. Every organization has smart devices all over the business that have important rising edge and falling edge events that you aren't listening to. The vast majority, in fact, we only connect about 7% of all our assets, all, not assets, uh, digital assets. So number one, what data do you have? That's a question you must ask. What do I have? Number two, where does that live? The answer is in lots of places. And you can't do what Tesla does or what Amazon does if it's in lots of places. Okay, question number three, how are you converting it to value on a common infrastructure? And the answer is you're not, but it's a loaded question. Get you thinking. And question number four, what is your digital strategy? All right, questions. Is anybody freaked out? <laughs> okay, go ahead. No, I have a question. Who, who? Well, what's the, is there anything that's not clear? Let me ask you that. So where do you start? I'll tell you where you start. Where you start is you need to figure out where you are in terms of digital maturity. How mature are we digitally? Okay, the best way to do that is you bring in consultants who do it. It doesn't have to be us. It could be anybody. Okay? But they must understand digital transformation, how it actually works. You, you, you name a company, a legacy company that's in the top half of the distribution, and we built the architecture. Of the top 10 companies, the 10 most digitally mature companies in the world, how many of those do you think are legacy companies? That is, older than 25 years. It's one. There's one legacy company in the top 10. Do you know what it is? Do you remember? Volkswagen. It's Volkswagen North America. That's right. Volkswagen North America is the only legacy company in the top 10. The other nine are all emerging companies. Where you start is, where are we? And what is our digital strategy? All right, no questions? Yes. Do we have one back here? Gotcha. We have a question from one of our um, online users. Okay. Um, so James Ackerley asked, Walker, really appreciate your YouTube content. Always insightful and love the transparent approach. To Industry 4.0 topics, at least in Australia, implementation of 4.0 solutions is very low in manufacturing. I assume it might be the same in the US. Despite lagging behind on the adoption front, do you feel that there are barriers to entry for 4.0 solutions that are starting to decrease through the advent of AI integration and low code solutions? Yes, so the answer is, the short answer is yes. The longer answer to his question is, there should be no barrier to digital transformation because let's say you're the lowest ranked person in the employee, or lowest ranked person in your organization, you have no authority. You're not a decision maker in any way and you control no money. That's still not an excuse. Actually, we shot, I shot a video a few years ago that says, win the results war. Don't fight theoretical battles, win the results war. And I, in that video, I talked about how I did that as an electrical technician at the very beginning of my career where I had no authority whatsoever. My career was mining, printing, steel, tier one automotive. Then I went to consulting. I worked for two integrators, then I created my first integrator in 2015. 
Since then, I've created 50 companies. The 50th just got created this year. And all the stuff that we do is technology driven. And that all started with me using technology to solve my problems. And when it made my job easier, the person next to me was like, how the hell did you do that? And I said, let me solve your problem too. And then our supervisor found out and I solved their problem. And then I solved the manager's problem. And then eventually the GM finds out and they promote you. And then that's how it works. Do not fight theoretical battles. Win the results war. Here's another, I want to say a couple things to the decision makers, those who control the dollars. Number one, do not allocate any capital beyond 12 months to digital transformation. If it's, if it's 12 months, if it's 366 days, you screwed up. You're allocating the capital no more than 12 months at a time. Okay, don't enter into contracts that are longer than 12 months. You have no idea where you are going. None. How can you commit capital to that? Those technology S-curves, scroll up real quick. Do you know what this is? Do you know why that line is flat at the beginning? Because that line starts with where the problem you have today. Right? The problem, I, I want to go in a certain place. And it's a function of what I know today. Digital transformation is about exponentially increasing the collective knowledge of an organization. And, and, and if what I want is a function of what I know, and what I know will increase exponentially, then what follows that? What I want will change exponentially. You cannot commit 12 months out. Why? Because that first 12 months is right here. Okay? Win the results war, don't fight theoretical battles, is the, sh is the long answer to that. Excellent. Uh, great answer, and thank you, James, for your question. Any other questions from the audience here for Walker? Go ahead. Is it any different for an OEM machine builder versus a manufacturer? Or things that we think about? All right, so the question is, is it any different for an OEM machine builder versus a manufacturer? The answer is no. The process is exactly the same. Let me ask you, do you build, you build machines? Right, so when I was with a tier one automotive supplier, I worked for Borg Warner, okay? We were also our own OEM. We built our own equipment. Okay, so I was in charge of punch presses, pin machines, and heat treat for the whole globe. So we built all the equipment. I was the engineer, the, the product engineer for all three of the, that, per, that domains. The question you must be asking yourself is this. What data do I have? Where is it? And how can it provide value to my customer? And then what you need to be able to do. Here, here's what Tesla does when they land. How long does it take Tesla to land a new asset on their plant floor, from the day they decide they want a new piece of machinery to the day it's turned on and fully integrated, how long do you think it takes? I'll give you a hint. From the day they broke ground in Shanghai on Giga to the day they ran the first car off the line was nine months. Nine months. Has anybody get, been to a Giga factory? Okay. It takes them four weeks. From the day they say, yes, please, to the day it is producing data on the plant floor, four weeks. Do you produce in four weeks? No. All right? Here, here's how they do it. You predict that they're going to need the asset, Okay, number one. So you're already working on the asset before they order it. Believe it or not, just like Amazon predicts what we're going to buy, you predict what your customers are going to buy. But more importantly, you put all that data together, just like we did in our unified namespace. And the last thing you do when you, after the functional acceptance test on the plant floor is you point that asset to the infrastructure and stream the data. There is no integration top down. There is no, I have to learn all the data points, and I got to put them in a place. There's none of that. It's plug, stream. So the answer is no. The questions are still the same. The process is a little different, but the questions are still the same. Am I? And by the way, this will be the first time I don't go over. I always go over, and we have two minutes left. So. Excellent. Any more questions for Walker? Any comments? Does anybody think I'm? Go ahead. Back there. Hold on, real quick. Let her give you the mic. I can hear like every other word. So um, for our organization, we're like going, I mean, purely from paper, and we're trying to get to a like digital system. 
Um, I've always been led to believe that the starting point for that would be like ERP. Um, I guess based on your presentation, would you recommend a different starting point? Um, yes. Or like where should I begin with that? Yeah, it's not that ERP isn't important. In fact, these guys are doing, they're doing an OT digital transformation and IT digital transformation at the same time. Then they're doing IT OT convergence later, okay? Um, the answer is no, ERP is not gonna solve all your problems. It, it won't. In fact, if you go in thinking it will, you're gonna be pissed off at your vendor which is why there was a lawyer up here talking, okay? <laughs> All right, the, 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 the fact is, is that digital transformation starts on the plant floor and in, for nearly every organization, it starts with manufacturing execution. Go, to the, go out to the, the presentation, no, go back to there, and go to the case study, right? This is a company just like yours, right? They were literally nothing. No ERP, this is a Japanese company, no ERP whatsoever no manufacturing execution. They had lots of really smart things on the plant floor that nobody was listening to. The short, the short of it is one, one production area, five production lines, they made high pressure fuel pumps, 47 machines with about 47 smart devices that had to be integrated. One year total integration, it took a three month IT delay to get the infrastructure in place. And then we just did digital strategy, architecture, infrastructure, smart thing connectivity, and then we integrated MES. This is what we gave them. This is no training, so go ahead and scroll down slowly. So this is basically giving the operators actual real state on this production line. So what is, where, where do we actually stand according to plan using digital data, not stuff we're doing on paper? By the way, they were calculating their overall equipment effectiveness 82% on paper. Okay, we knew that that was gar We knew that that wasn't true. Keep going. So we just give them this stuff. We don't train them on anything. But what they are able to do is look at the reason they're not producing, okay? Scroll down to the results. Here are the actual results. An 18 month window, just by doing this piece. This cost them $250,000 of their own money and $250,000 of my money. I paid for half of this proof of concept because otherwise we wouldn't have been able to do it and I wanted to win the results war, right? I didn't want to fight with them over whether this was gonna work. On day one, their overall equipment efficiency, overall equipment effectiveness was 42%. They were calculating at 82, we knew it was 42. In 60 days, they were at 70%, in six months they were at 80 and they held it for a year. Next. By month, this is the worst performing asset, was 27% efficiency. That means if they thought they should produce four parts per minute, they were producing one. That's what it boils down to. They got that to 80 and held it for a year. Next, waste. They were producing 3,500 units of waste per month when they started, 500 use of units of waste per month at the end of 18 months. By the way, this is a world-class Japanese organization. They have Kaizen engineers everywhere. They have chokate sheets on every asset. They are world-class. Next, production. They were producing 35,000 fuel pumps per month and they got that to 70,000. Do you know what the return on investment for this was? $25 million in 18 months. 25 million with a 46% labor reduction cost, re reduction in, in labor cost for $250,000. Why? Because they started at the most important place in the business. Your business doesn't happen in ERP. It happens on the plant floor. And if your plant floor isn't optimized, and you start with ERP, well, what did you do? You took garbage and threw it into a million dollar ERP. That's what you did. So no, don't start with ERP. You can do it in parallel, but it isn't gonna be driven from ERP. That, those, are the res those are real, tangible, brass tacks. They took that $25 million and they digitally transformed all of North America. Just the efficiencies, these guys, they're gonna save 2.5 million euros a month through one project, one project. And, and it's 2.5 million euros in one area, five casting furnaces. That's what the return is. So you start in manufacturing. All right, with that, I'm way over. I apologize. Thank you guys for hearing me.